Hi. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. And I, it's a completely different world. I'm actually a physics teacher, but I set up oh, the Institute for Research in Schools to release the potential of young people. And in terms of embracing change, we are definitely about changing how people experience science at school. And really, because I think if we don't do something, there won't be enough people going on doing science, but also they won't see how they can contribute. Yesterday, which of course isn't on my slides because it only happened yesterday, um, we had a launch of a groundbreaking new project at the Wellcome Genome Campus, you know, where they sequence the whole human genome. And the launch yesterday was to allow about a thousand young people to annotate or curate, is what they call, so to look at the genome of a whitworm, which causes ghastly, you know, it's a parasitic worm that causes ghastly troubles for young people, especially in developing countries. And what was amazing is this is the first time that a project will have students and scientists together being in the same community. So in terms of embracing change, wouldn't that be lovely if, you know, young people were just part of that community? OK, they may not be pigs, although you'll see he's in one of our slides, because that's where I was this time last year, uh, launching a project with Peter Higgs of Higgs boson CERN fame. But wouldn't it be lovely if actually people had that experience of... This is how we think about the world. This is how we tackle scientific questions. So we are about embracing change completely. We're about, you know, getting in and saying to DfE, please change the experience that students have of science. Let them contribute to the forefront, to cutting a chance where we don't know the answer. And the thing is, it was so beautiful. The prevalence of this ghastly uh, parasitic worm disease is often in places like Colombia. There was a Colombian scientist there yesterday. And what really resonated with the young people, because I think, you know, I don't think we appreciate how, you know, I've been a teacher for all my life, having come to this, uh, having come to Sussex. So the last time I was here when I was at university, uh, actually come to hear Mendelssohn. So I didn't hear a band. I heard Mendelssohn violin concerto in this hall many 5,000 years ago when I was here at, at Sussex. And, um, and I think, you know, we don't, we don't value enough what young people have to offer as their young people. And these kids were saying, this is what we want to do. We want to solve this problem with this nasty parasitic worm so that we can find vaccines and cures to help our peers, our friends in developing countries who can't go to school because they have this awful disease. And you think, that's what young people are for. Now, I wanted to ask you, really, being a teacher, of course, and I want full participation, especially that back row. I can see you're slacking already. <laughs> There's always a backbench gang, isn't there? Right. Who? What I want to... I just want a quick thought, because it strikes me that you know, your business is the most creative business and people assume, wrongly in my view, that science isn't creative. And that's partly why if you get kids being creative, doing science at school, they will realise that there's a whole lot more involved in doing science and contributing to cutting edge, you know, finding those solutions. So out of you lot, how many of you carried on, how many of you come to this with some kind of science further qualification, like university or apprenticeship or further qualification? Like, hands up. Oh, there's more, there's more than I thought, but it's a small proportion, is it? What's that? About 5%, 10% max. So that, that I think, well, that's a bit of a risky thing, actually. I think, can I do this? Yes, but that actually tells me that a lot of you thought that science wasn't a creative thing to do while you were at school because it was so narrow, probably, because you had to... You know, one of the things I said yesterday, it doesn't really matter when you're doing a pendulum experiment, which quite a number of people have done before, whether you get the right answer, because we know that, you know... Oh! <laughs> shouldn't have done that. Uh, we know that gravity holds us down, uh, almost. Uh, yeah, certainly does work there, didn't it? Um, we know the gravity holds us down. And so, you know, it doesn't matter whether the kids get it right or not, and they probably copy from their friends anyway. But it does matter when you're doing some real science that you do find that there's this nasty gene which can be attacked to solve this horrible um, parasitic worm disease in a developing country. 
So actually, the whole idea that the science you're doing at school is important and you can have value, I think, is what we're trying to embrace as change in the science curriculum. So I'll quickly run through a must... Oh, no, I'm all right, aren't I? I'm a... It's 10.15. I've... Right, OK, right, OK. Uh, I can go on a bit, so I mustn't. Right, so that's me. Don't tell me off. I'll be in detention myself, won't I? Oh, mustn't hit me. Yeah, right. OK, so... Right. OK, so what I was going to do is I was just going to give you a bit of a story about how we did this and what kids have done, my kids and other kids, as part of the Institute for Research in Schools. So the Institute for Research in Schools only started um, last March. Sorry about the standing bit. doesn't matter, does it? Um, started last March, and we've already got... When I looked yesterday, it was 429 schools signed up. So there is, obviously, it chimes with teachers who think... Oh, a chance to do something which isn't, you know, the standard textbook. Chimes with kids, gives them a chance to flourish and really see what they can offer themselves in science. So I'll give you a bit of a story about different projects which... So I've been doing this sort of thing for about the last 10, 12 years uh, at my school. I did teach in Kent. I've just um, started teaching in our northern hub in Sheffield. So uh, I still am a teacher, but I run the institute, but it's getting so big and so much going on that um, I have to do a bit more of this sort of thing rather than directly in the classroom. But kids have done amazing things, so I just thought I'd tell you the sort of things they've done to give you an idea, because so often you go to academics and you say, you know, uh, is there somehow that students can be integrally involved in your research project? And they say, well, what sort of students? I say, well, you know, 14 to 18 year olds and they sort of look at you as though you're completely mad and I say they've got loads to offer you know I know a lot of this is about digital stuff kids can do loads of computational stuff far better far better than any teachers um, but you know they're really good at all that stuff and they love fiddling about and making programs and all those sort of stuff which kids have time to do and it's a question I think of shifting how we value what kids do in school that it's not just you know I don't know, I bet some of you have had... My daughter's just done GCSEs. And anything more designed to put you off learning, I do not know. Such a gruel, God, you know, let's be excited about science. Oh, no, let's study for our GCSEs. So, um, I mean, I know you've got to do them. I mean, you know, I'm not against all that. You've got to do all that, but let's improve what we offer to kids and let's really embrace change to value these kids. So, where's your homework? It is true that some of it was in space. So here we go. If we think about our beautiful planet, that is to scale, right? We are in, uh, we are in the sort of grip of the solar wind from the sun and great chunks of plasma come flying out and cause things like the aurora. Who's seen the northern lights? Oh, you are lucky. I want to go and see that. Oh, so gorgeous. So lovely. Right, so... What happened is we got uh, a professor from Imperial phoned up and said, I've just been interviewing somebody from your school, phoned up the head, I've uh, just been interviewing somebody from your school, and uh, I was, I'm an old boy of the school, this is in Kent. Uh, is there anything I could do to help? Big mistake, actually, because poor man now is chair of trustees of Iris. Iris is a proper charity and everything. And one of the things he did to help was this young man, uh, Peter, who's now chair of our student advisory board. He's just actually now Dr Hatfield. Uh, he said, I've got this problem which I want solved about um, the geometry of coronal mass ejections, of all this stuff flying off the sun. You know, just the standard thing that a 16, 17-year-old student would get their teeth into. Well, Peter did. And you see, what I did... Oh, I've got this pointer here. Oh, oh look at that. Um, so... What Peter did, which was really clever, is to... We put him down and we said the Langton Star Centre. And so academics, when they're citing this paper, say, yes, the Langton Star Centre. Yes, like, what is that? And you say, it's actually a school. And this boy was 17 when he wrote this single author paper. Of course kids can do stuff. And they sort of go, oh, oh yes, yes, lovely. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is a bit of an extreme in the sense that it's quite hard to write a paper when you're 17 and get it in a, you know... I know you all read avidly high-energy density physics. It's one of those ones you have by your bed to get you to sleep at night, I'm sure. But, you know, it's still, it's a proper journal paper. Um, then the CERN thing, yeah, of course. So CERN is, I've taken over 1,000 kids to CERN, and it's where, you know, you're trying to recreate the 
beginnings of the universe, the Big Bang, by smashing protons into each other. Everybody knows what a proton is? Hands up. Good. Right. So just imagine... A, all they have at CERN, has anybody been to CERN? You should, it's gorgeous. You should have your next conference there. Have a cylinder about this size of hydrogen. They whip off the electrons, leaving the protons, and that will fill up the Large Hadron Collider. And it is large, 27 kilometres round. That will fill up the Large Hadron Collider for the lifetime of it. That much hydrogen, about 20 years. Anyway, so we got involved with some people who make some detector chips to look at the particles uh, smashing into each other at CERN. And this is what kids said. They said, Miss, why don't we put those in space? Because you could actually do a lot of really good measurements of all that stuff flying out from the sun using those chips. And so I said to say, you know, I, did, I, I remember coming back from a trip and the kids sat there saying, oh, Miss, I'm so bored. I said, I've just taken you to CERN. You know, I've had <laughs> no sleep for four days uh, trying to make sure that no more children returned than actually went. And... Um, so I was sitting there, I said, oh, I'm going to say, and here's a competition to put something in space. And so I, I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll ask then. And of course, it turned out that nobody had put these detector chips into space. So me and my kids had a bit of a race with NASA, as you do, because we managed to get an arrangement here of five of those chips which are in the Large Hadron Collider at the bottom of this satellite called Tet Demosat-1. And that's a sort of a washing machine-sized satellite. Satellites come in two sizes, double-decker bus washing machine. We're about washing machine size. And it's up in space um, now. So it launched NASA annoyingly beat us. It's really, you know, the, I'll tell you this really quickly, but um, this chap from NASA who helped us, he... Uh, he was giving a talk at a big conference about radio and dosimetry because obviously they've got to look after all the research scientists and the astronauts on the ISS, on the International Space Station. And uh, Larry Pinsky was saying about, um, yeah, so they're developing this lucid Langton ultimate cosmic ray intensity detector. You have to get a good acronym. And they're putting it on. And, and the person from NASA looking after the astronauts says, well, why haven't we got that? on the ISS, and Larry said, oh, it's being developed by a school in Kent. And apparently, <laughs> that really pissed off NASA. And so NASA then put loads of money in and put loads of these chips on and beat us. And I'm not joking, you think I probably am, but I'm not, I promise you. So anyway, this is, it's really annoying because I wanted this to be live, but they couldn't, so I, actually, this is a bit of a fake. This is a screenshot. But if you go on our website, you will see where Lucid is right now. It is live and going around the Earth, a bit like the ISS, every 90 minutes. Um, so as I sort of gave you a bit of a hint, anybody guess where this chip is? I've more or less said that, haven't I? Yeah, ruined that one. Uh, on the International Space Station, there were five of them. And because they'd sort of beaten us, and that was a bit annoying, we asked if we could have all the data. And they said yes, uh, because they're only actually using the whole lot of all the data of the frames to check out the energy. I must keep going. Right. Uh, and so we're actually analysing these pictures of radiation which the astronauts are getting on the ISS. And the chips are called Time Picks chips uh, from the Medipix collaboration. And they're just like radiation monitors, a bit like if you had a Geiger counter at school, which went bleep, 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 bleep. It's it actually gives you a visual output, so it's much more appealing. Um, we cleverly called our project Timpix because of a certain famous person. Yeah, good old gorgeous Tim Peak, measuring peak radiation. Ghastly. Uh, and as you said, this is the chat from our northern hub, uh, Miles. He and his team, they're about... Equal girls and boys, actually, and this is what's so interesting about doing science in school, is that there isn't that gender divide at all. One of the things I've tried for my whole life is to get more women into physics, and we do. You know, you get loads more girls in, because actually they can see this is something meaningful, and we can get going, and we can make a difference. And so Mars and his team found this problem with NASA. Um, so they basically took the whole of Tim Peake's data and looked... It's interesting... They just decided to look at where there were no hits of radiation, and they found that there were these minus numbers. And so we got in touch with NASA, and NASA said, oh, yeah, yeah, we know about that, but just send us all your results, would you? <laughs> and, and what was funny, it, uh, they thought this minus thing happened like once a year, but Miles and his team found it happened once or twice a day. And the thing was, it was a beautiful story in the sense that 
Larry, our lovely NASA man, said that's exactly what Iris is about. Kids have got time to do this, they're interested, they like to look at new data, and they can generally help NASA. But I think, I think the reason it sort of backfired was the day before Trump had been signing the NASA funds for the year. And I think probably NASA were a little bit edgy about, you know, if Trump heard, you know, UK schoolboy solves NASA data error, that, so they sort of said, oh, no, keep it quiet. But, you know, it went on the world at one. And we were on the world at one yesterday as well. Uh, and so it went viral and, woo, that was quite fun. So anyway, there we go. <laughs> but also we're about giving opportunities for kids who, who, who don't think that they're part of that community. We're so into getting disadvantaged uh, schools to be involved. And we had some amazing work from a school in Glasgow. Down, I don't know if you know. And... Um, they, we took them over to CERN because CERN wanted them to present about it. And that's, if you go to CERN, that's the reception. So uh, it's fantastic and they had a marvellous time. They presented along with other students, uh, a couple of other students here. This boy here, he was at my school and he was a really quiet, shy boy, came to me in year nine and he said, Miss, do you think I can help with the Langton Star Centre? And I said, yes, brilliant. And by the end of this, he's now gone off to do computer science at Kent and he wrote a platform called TAPAS, uh, Time Picks Analysis Platform at School, which CERN now used to analyse the data for those chips. You know, and that's just giving those kids amazing confidence. So I'm going to keep going. Now, this is where I was last year, and any guesses? It's a bit of a clue here. Yes, yeah, so that's Peter Hicks. There were no hands up there, folks. This is not good enough. I've only been going 10 minutes, and you're not concentrating. Honestly. Anyway, so Peter Higgs, it was gorgeous. So funny, we started off, this is our project, we're doing particle physics. And he said, I'm not actually a particle physicist, I'm a field theorist. I said, oh, but that's fine. You know, mustn't let that throw us. Anyway, these kids, these are real jokers. Elliot and Elliot, they were such a laugh. I said, I'm Elliot and I'm Elliot. And they asked a question, they said to Peter Higgs, um, if we find this, so this is kids analysing data from the Atlas detector, genuinely helping out CERN. And they said, if we find this um, uh, new particle, which is like a decay of a Higgs, can we call it a Higglet? And <laughs> Peter Higgs said, well, I wouldn't mind too much, but I'm not sure my children would be that keen. It was just gorgeous. So that's where I was up at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And look here, this person is Peter Hatfield, my old student. So the students never leave, they're all part of it. These girls, you'll see on the video right at the end, which I'd better shut up, they, uh, you know, it's just transforming their view that they can be part of the science community. So quickly on, we've done lots of lovely things, the slugs with the RHS. Uh, this thing yesterday was just unbelievable. So look out for uh, genome decoders. We were trending on Twitter. Can you imagine a school research charity? We trended yesterday. Oh, I was so excited. Uh, so made my day. So that was genome decoders where all these kids, we had um, 250 kids in the Welcome Genome Campus getting ready to really help with this Whitworm project. Uh, and we do lots of chemistry. I always get told off I'm a physicist. Uh, do lots of chemistry. And we do lots of amazing stuff with space. Uh, this is the uh, trace gas orbiter whole thing for looking at Mars, looking at the, you know, uh, gases on Mars. There's methane on Mars, which shouldn't really be there. In fact, there's a whole thing on the radio this morning about methane being such a problem with uh, global warming and things. But there's methane on Mars, and they've sent this trace gas orbiter out to Mars. And one of the things we were saying is, you know, how do people understand the environment they live in before they start understanding the, you know, the methane on Mars? You know, you might understand that there's quite a lot of methane from cows, and there's probably not methane from cows on Mars, but, you know, getting a better understanding of their environment. So we are working with the Eden Project and the UK Space Agency to get... Um, sort of trace gas monitors all over the place in schools and get them linking up to think about what are suitable atmospheres for life, where might life be, and how can we improve the atmospheres and the particulates and all that sort of stuff. Getting students to own this sort of stuff, empowering them to make a difference to their own environment. So, we also have loads of seminars, so I must go, I must stop now, uh, because I'm just going to show a quick film. But here, we sort of, it's not just about, you know, aspiration, participation, attainment, it's about um, 
actually giving kids confidence to present. Uh, we have lots of symposium. People say, oh, they're like scientific symposium. They're not, they are scientific, scientific symposia for students. And this is my quick film to sum it all up. What is so important about the Aris Initiative is it gives people a chance to do something and feel that they are attacking a topic where the answer isn't in the back of the book, to realise that science is about questions as much as about answers. Science is great because it's all about moving forward, doing things that might seem impossible at one point, but in the future it becomes a possibility. Those of us doing research know this, but it's easy to get this over to young people with proper preparation, and that's what's going to be, be done here. All of the research doesn't have to be done by people who have PhDs and stuff. People who are teenagers who are doing their levels still can do stuff. The thrill of discovery, to feel that, that's so fantastic and if you can give those students in secondary schools the opportunity to experience that it'll be contagious it'll be addictive it allows me to kind of spread my enthusiasm for things scientific research with the students and, and, and doing it with a real bit of science research where we don't know the answer it is just the cherry on the cake really it's just, it just makes it great if we have students who are better informed they're more likely to be successful on the degrees if we have some interaction with the schools early on, then the transition from school to university is helped immensely. And from our own students' point of view, our undergraduates and our postgraduates, they get a greater insight into the wider impact of their own research. There are lots of scientific projects which just need an analysis of lots of data. There's so much data that you can discover something new. You can even discover a planet around another star. The aim of the project is to look for new particles currently unknown to science. We're able to bring data from the Large Hadron Collider from CERN to schools to allow students there to do their own research at the cutting edge. It's one of the biggest opportunities I think we've ever had. Schools just learn the course, do a bit of stuff that's already pre-approved and this is like frontier physics. So the idea is that this meeting will be your opportunity to input into Iris, what you think it should be, how you think it should evolve, how you think it should change, what's good, what's bad. Here's the opportunity to say, this is all we want to be doing, this is how we want to be doing it. Hopefully in this meeting I will say nothing and you'll be doing all the conversation. It's massively satisfying to see this incredible dedication and, and skill of the students. I mean, they, they make fantastic presentations, they're carrying out work that, you know, techniques they wouldn't normally reach until second or third year undergraduate courses, if then. They're driving the research, they're pushing it, they're coming up with their ideas, they're the ones who are moving this forward. At events like this, it's quite interesting going around talking to everyone, like we've had people from universities coming over to us and asking what we're doing. We've been studying the expression of genes we believe to be associated with the early onset of osteoarthritis. We're here to talk about the Myelin Basic Protein Project. Our project is investigating cardiac myosin and contraction velocity in birds. So I'm going to talk firstly a bit of an introduction to earthquakes, why it's important for the peckham, and then some new theories and then some problems with the theory that we're going to have to iron out. Most of our research comes from Tim Peak um, on the ISS. What we want to do is we want to create a radiation map of the UK. Our aim is not only to identify an association between diabetes and the genetic components between ethnic origin, but to also ultimately educate our community. There are so many things going on with Lucid. We've got some amazing results already. It's only looking bigger and better for the future. We're looking back 13 billion years into the past and within this range are over half a million galaxies. Uh, I developed a bi-specific antibody, um, something you know you do every day. Um, <laughs> These amazing students are actually solving those engineering grand challenges right now. As well as the schools and the universities benefiting, science itself will benefit. So, uh, any questions but not here, obviously. Afterwards, some other time. Thank you.